Hello, Internet people, or uh, maybe it's Internet speaker builders. It's Peter again, and uh, boy, it's been a while since I've done a video, and uh, <laughs> a good amount of water has passed under the bridge, and um, so I thought it was, I just needed to get on uh, and uh, sort of give an update and, and show some things that uh, I think are relevant and um, talk about a whole list of things that um, y'all should know about uh, my channel. And the first is monetization. Uh, monetization, something I didn't choose to do uh, when I had a choice. And uh, YouTube, at their core, they're an advertising company, and I don't begrudge them that. That's just the nature of the beast, and the ads you see on people's uh, videos are how they, how they run the business. That's, that's the product they have for sale. And uh, by not opting in on that, it, it kept my channel ad-free. And I kind of like that, but uh, their, um, their business model is changing a little bit. And they sent me an email and, and informed me that they wanted the, uh, what do I want to say, in order to keep my channel active, they wanted the option to uh, monetize. And that was no longer a decision I could make. And... Uh, so the, the choice became, do I want YouTube to receive what little of that advertising income goes to the creator, or do I want, uh, do I want it to come to me? And, and I opted for the latter. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that you roll with the punches. I rolled with the punches. So the reason you see ads on my channel now is that. And um, I should tell you, I, I, was, I was surprised by the level of, of uh, income that one could make on, uh, on just a few videos on, on YouTube. I mean, to tell you, I took that money and I thought I should show you what I got with it. And it was a car. I bought a car. And this is it right here. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dream car. I mean, it's an orange car with a great big green wing. And I mean, what more could a person want? I like sports cars. Um, I usually like them a little bit bigger, but anyway, uh, you know, know that um, by you watching this channel that uh, you've done me a huge favor. I, I couldn't have afforded this any other way. So enough of that. <laughs> oh, let's see, what else is on my list? Um, so my, maybe I always feel like I need to kind of explain the story because I have to explain it to myself. I mean, when I, when I started with all this stuff on YouTube and, and cutting flat packs and supplying to speaker builders uh, all over the world, actually, I, I just I didn't have a clear target, but it's kind of... Uh, it's kind of evolved in, in a way I've, I've rather enjoyed, and I've been able to do it, uh, especially when it comes to the flat packs, I've been able to do it without, without uh, what do I want to say, without my business taking it in the shorts. I opted to get very efficient in the way that I program the router, in the way that I do the whole thing, and as a result of that, um, by doing what I call mini mass production, I, um, I was able to, to offer what I think is a, a really good value, uh, bang for buck, and not the cheapest thing you can buy, although it might be. I, I, the, the two here are actually, uh, and these are other kits for the same, for the same um, speaker. Uh, the XLS Encore. If, if, you, if you're not familiar with my channel, that might all seem new to you. But 
Um, so my whole thing was about uh, value and n not sacrificing my business to, to do it. And, and honestly, it, it has been a good thing. Um, uh, for me, anyway. I mean, I, I've gotten to do the things I love, and uh, I've gotten to get other people in, involved, and uh, I've, I've truly enjoyed the, the interaction and the whole thing. And uh, so, so that's kind of the backstory. And now for the, um, for the, for the not so good current story, uh, something has caught up with me and what I'm doing, and that is material costs have gone up unbelievably, uh, unlike anything I've ever witnessed in the, in the supply world. And, and it's not just me. I mean, it's, if it has anything to do with shipping or a million other things, it's probably affected. And, and I suspect y'all have seen that with something in your life, but uh, in, in my little world, what it's affected is material costs. And um, to, to give you an idea, uh, the, the Ranger Board Platinum I use, which is a premium MDF, this is not the same as what you're gonna find in Home Depot or, or almost any place that is not in the cabinet building supply industry. And, uh, and I'm gonna show you some examples of, of why that is, or uh, some demonstrations of what that is, but uh, um, prices have gone up. Suffice to say, prices have gone up a lot. Uh, my cost on the, uh, the raw material, or the uh, Ranger Board Platinum has gone up uh, over 40%, I, I, as I recall, I, I figured it out, it was about 42% with no end in sight. I mean, there's no ceiling on that. My suppliers tell me they know what they're gonna pay for something when it gets on a truck and is being shipped. And um, the, uh, the, the cost on uh, Baltic birch plywood that I use has gone up over 80%. I mean, that's just unprecedented. And the reality is I run lean and mean and close to the bone. There is not fluff in the, the pricing for my flat packs. There's no fluff. So when the price goes up like that, I, I literally start losing money, not, not profit. I mean money, I, what it costs me to make is more than, than what I'm selling for. And that just uh, isn't sustainable. It, it, it just isn't sustainable. That's the long and the short of it. as much as I love the hobby and the industry and, and I would like to supply the world for, for free, I, I just can't do it. it. It's just not feasible. And um, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years in small businesses, uh, it, it, you can't continue like that. I mean, it comes a point where you just have to stop the bleeding. So if it sounds like I'm making a, an explanation for something that's going to happen, you're right. Um, I have stockpiled material at the lower prices and it, I at this point, it's probably gonna run out a, uh, around the end of uh, 2021. So um, at some place really close to that, prices will go up. And specifically what those will be is the, uh, the flat packs I cut from Ranger Ford Board, <laughs> Ranger Board Platinum, which is this high density MDF are gonna go from $140, which they are now, to $162. And the only thing I've changed, and, and by the way, I mean, I didn't arrive at those prices by some accident. They, I took this and lined item every aspect of the operation. I mean, down to the shipping boxes and the foam I use and the, every little thing I, I figured into it. 
And that's what determined the cost of the flat pack. Now, the only thing that I changed in, in this new pricing is the material cost. Everything else remains the same. So that, that's all reflected in, in the cost. So goes from 140 to 162. Baltic Birch took even a bigger jump. It's gonna go from 176 to 218. Shipping will probably remain the same. So far, uh, UPS has not changed their shipping rates a whole bunch. Um, their shipping times have, have, they no longer guarantee. And uh, you know, we live in a, in a different world now and I, I'm just trying to kind of roll with the punches. And, uh, and you know, I, I wish I didn't have to, but that's the way it is. So on to the next thing. So price increases, and I'll, I'll put that, and the way you order from me, if, you, if you're new to, to my game here, is my email address will be in the description. Email me, I don't have a website, I don't have anything like that because it adds expense to the way, to my business that I'd, I'd pass on to you. And I'm just not in favor of that, partly because I don't know how to build a website, so I'd have to get some help and I don't really have a whole bunch of products to offer and I'm not really looking to expand a business right now. I, I'm, I'm on the tail end of my, my uh, career and trying to find things that kind of fit into the other parts of my life and uh, so I won't be jumping the flat pack business to light speed. I think there's a business model there I'm just not going to be the one to, to spearhead it. Um, it just it just eats up too much of my time. Anyway, enough about me and all that. So, um, uh, what's next on the list? Um, if you're wondering why I'm looking down, it's because my list is taped to the the uh, the tripod. So. Uh, you know, I, I'll, maybe I'll cover this. So here's what I'm going to do. These are flat packs, and what I what I I'm not I'm not targeting somebody here. I'm just really looking to uh, show you the consumer um, what I think is a good value for the money. And uh, these two kits are actually more expensive than the kit I offer, and I. I I don't want to make it seem like I'm out to start a battle or anything like that. I'm not. I'm, I'm about showing what I think represents a, a good value in the marketplace. And, and not the least of which is um, I can operate at a really skinny margin because this isn't a livelihood for me. This is a hobby and I have some pretty expensive equipment in a building, but it is, it is not um, my, my living income. So there you get a little insight into my finances and you're probably thinking, well, why doesn't he just give it away? And I just, I gotta tell you folks, having been in, involved in small businesses for the whole last half of my life, I, I just, I just can't go there in good conscience. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me to donate to, to something like this. Um, I, I am charitable in plenty of arenas, I think, but this isn't gonna be one of them. So what I intend to do is kind of um, unpack these and, and show you what's going on there and, and, and contrast it with my kit, which is what you see here. And by the way, the only place you get my flat packs is from me. I don't, they don't go to any vendors. They don't get warehoused someplace. And it, any of that all adds to cost. I mean, you can, you can look at it any way you want, but the reality is the minute I start adding service levels or distributors or anything like that, it, the cost goes up. It just simply a, a fact of business. That's not something I can change. So, um, that's my long-winded introduction, and uh, I think I'll end it here, and we'll uh, uh, set some of this stuff aside, and we'll unpack these, and we'll see just what, uh, just what you get here. And uh, 
So we'll catch back up with you in a little bit. Okay, here I am for uh, round two. I, I shot a lot of, I shot actually several segments of this video and realized that uh, I goofed up. So it's a different day. It's, a, it's the next day uh, from my perspective. From your perspective, it's just a couple of seconds. So um, let's call this flat pack uh, exhibit A. And uh, this was available online. Um, I purchased it for $170 and there was some shipping charges too. So anyway, um, it, I, I gotta be honest, it, it's, it's got some problems. Um, and uh, not the least of which, well, you know what, let's just, I'm just gonna try and be non-judgmental here and kind of go through it. But uh, so these are the braces, these are the dowel braces, which, um, you know, are fine. And, and by the way, as he shoots those all over the place, um, this is using the, uh, the construction as it's detailed on the uh, GR research site. So it's all butt joints, no, no rabbits, dados, uh, anything like that. So um, fairly, fairly uh, simple in the way it was designed. And um, I don't have anything really against butt joints, but the rabbits really make things both easier to assemble and stronger. So enough said about that. Um, one of the things that, and by the way, I've, I've looked at all this stuff. I mean, I, I wanted to see what, what was going on here. I mean, here's somebody offering the same thing I offer and, and uh, I, I kind of like to know how I stack up because I put considerable thought and energy into making sure that what I was producing lived up to my standards, which are, you know, maybe ridiculously high, but uh, it, it's what I like. So, so you benefit from my OCD because of that. Uh, when you purchase a flat pack, I guess in other ways, maybe you don't, but uh, so in my mind, when you have something that's cut on a, uh, on, a, on a good CNC router, and by the way, all CNC routers are not the same. The, the one I chose to purchase is a, a commercial grade router. It's capable of doing really tight tolerances day in, day out, no sweat. Um, I looked at less expensive machines, but it wasn't something that, it wasn't a place that I wanted to start. And, and you know, I should back up. I did start with a tiny, a, a small machine, um, but it was a good one. It wasn't a cheesy one. Now there's CNC routers available that are, that are really inexpensive. And from reading on the forums, I, they seem like more of a frustration than anything else to people. So, uh, you know what, I'm not here to advertise the, the router, but suffice to say that uh, I, I don't know what this was cut on, but a router only does what it's told to do. It, it, it really depends on programming to hold tolerance and accuracy and stuff like that. So I look at things like the fit. Um, the, this, is, this is for the uh, uh, Biney post cup that Danny offers as an option. And you know, it, it, it's a little loose. Uh, there, there should be some clearance there, so I don't consider that really bad. Um, one thing that is variable though, and, and changeable, is I would look at anything like this that needs to be recessed into the cabinet, you'd want it to be flush. I mean, that's just, uh, I, I would consider that to be good quality craftsmanship. And it's certainly doable when you have, when you're cutting on a CNC router. It, it's, it's harder to achieve if you're using a rabbiting bit in a handheld router, but it's not impossible. Uh, so this drops in about a sixteenth of an inch too deep. Um, I don't consider that to be a big problem, but it, it could have been different. Uh, let's put it that way. And the other thing that I'll point out here, which <laughs> The front seems, so the baffle uh, is, it's got another kind of issue, sort of the opposite thing. And um, 
So this is the tweeter that comes with XLS Encore. And I can tell you folks, that doesn't fit. Uh, this, should, this should slide down into that rabbit. And, uh, and, and the rabbit, I'm, I'm talking about this recess right here. That is cut to allow the tweeter to sit down flush. And in this case, it's pretty important because the woofer sits on top of it. And let me show you what happens when that doesn't work. And, and, and this is... This is a quality control problem. I mean, I, I look at this and, and I, I could not in good conscience send something like this out. Uh, I, I just couldn't. And that doesn't mean somebody won't. Uh, it just means I couldn't. And I won't. <laughs> so I don't know if you see that, but that tweeter is not sitting flat on the cabinet which holds this up which means that creates a gap there this woofer is is intended to seal let me set this down is intended to seal on this gasket right there where my finger is pointing and um, if it can't sit down on the cabinet you're going to be putting stress on the frame. You're not going to be sealing with the gasket. There's, there's a number of things there that are not going to work the way they're intended. And uh, if I had to guess at, at least some of the problem here, uh, one thing that I have come to know programming for cutting on router is that the dimensions that manufacturers give here Maybe the exact dimension as designed, but there could be tolerances within their production. And there also needs to be some allowance for this to fit. If, if I'm cutting something the exact uh, dimension of this uh, plate, they won't fit. They, they, were, they are the same size, so you need clearance in order for that to work. This doesn't have clearance. I don't know what the problems are, but it, it's, it's not workable the way it is. It would take reworking to make it work. And uh, one thing I might also point out here, now this is a little scale I use when I'm finishing. Uh, sometimes I use pigments and I need to, um, I need to weigh them. So um, this is <laughs> going to be kind of derogatory here, what I would consider featherweight MDF. And um, I have some of this. I use it for a spoil board on my router, which means I, I suck vacuum right through it. And it works really well for that. It's, it doesn't machine real cleanly when you get into rabbits and stuff like that. Um, this isn't too bad, actually, <laughs> except that it's not the right size. Uh, so I, I, the stuff I use, the Ranger Board Platinum, is very different. And the easy way to tell this is by the weight. And now I will show you something here that is kind of telling. Now obviously my, uh, this, so this is from my flat pack. Uh, it's, it's smaller, and the reason why is because of the construction difference. And uh, but let's, let's just drop these on a scale. Now, you're going to have to trust that I'm telling you this for real. And uh, that weighs 17.79 ounces. This smaller piece of MDF with the same cutouts um, weighs 22.36 ounces. So that, what I'm trying to demonstrate there is that density in MDF is directly related to weight. And uh, the high density, high polymer, not high polymer, what am I trying to say? The uh, Ranger Board Platinum has a lot of glue in it that glues all the dust together. And that, that makes it more dense and it makes it heavier. So um, these are, this is inexpensive 
MDF by comparison. I can buy this stuff. I mean, I, I you know, it's all available to me, but it's something I choose not to do. And so <laughs> moving on here, um, now I know this doesn't work because I've already tried it. So uh, using a dowel construction, um, the dowels are tight, which is a design function that I eliminated, or uh, what do I want to say? The dowels in my kit aren't intended to be tight because the glue I use in that specific one area is designed to take up any slack. I didn't want the dowel to interfere with the clamping of the rest of the cabinet. And so it was a design uh, choice. Now, when I first took this out, I thought, okay, well, it's using, uh, it's using butt joint construction, which means the front and the back define the width and the height of the cabinet and everything kind of slides in behind that. Well, th obviously that's not the case here. Um, that fits inside, I guess, and which means that this cabinet is now an inch and a half too wide. Well, so I thought, well, okay, maybe, uh, maybe they got the dowel the wrong width um, or the wrong length, so it makes the cabinet the wrong width. And then I kind of eyeballed the sides and theoretically this, this dimension should be the same as this dimension and everything fits inside. Well, I'm not sure what happened or what was intended here, um, but that appears to be sitting on top, which means once you get the top and the bottom, in you're, you're now the outer dimensions are of the cabinet box not only don't fit this but they're an inch and a half bigger than what the plans call for so could it be reworked uh yeah but golly i i have a hard time justifying any reworking of something that could have been much better it's it's i don't know how to put this it's a failure i mean this th this to me is not good um it's certainly not something i can recommend in the way of a of a purchase and it's just got too many problems too many oversights too many errors too many things that make it um not good and it, if it seems like I'm slamming it, eh, you know, my intention isn't to, to just be mean here. It, it's to kind of inform the public that, wow, it, you know, you have choices out there. And this is not true, or this is true of everything, not just flat packs. Um, and when I look at this, I think, wow, this, this, the idea was good, perhaps, but the execution just flopped. So we're going to set that one aside, and uh, I'll get the next one up here, and we'll have a look at it. Okay, we are on to uh, Exhibit B. I'm not naming names here, because that's not, my, I, not, not why I'm doing this. I, I just, um, yeah, I, I guess I am promoting the flat packs I cut, but more importantly, I, I look at this and say, whoever these folks were, they jumped into the, the market and uh, they, they invited the, the comparison. So I, um, you know, I'm happy to do it. And, and to be honest, if, if I saw a shortcoming, the, of my kit versus these, I'd, I'd do something about it. I mean, I just can't leave stuff like that alone, but <laughs> it might say more about me than it does anything else. So uh, this one is better. If, if, if that first flat pack, uh, if I were to grade it, uh, it's an F. It is, it is wrong in, in enough ways that I would consider it to be a failure. Um, this one, is better. Um, again, dowel construction, uh, I, I'm kind of glad that 
took hold, I, I think it's a better and uh, more elegant way to, to do things than the original plans. I assume these are crossover boards. Um, I, uh, oh, you know what? Let me sh So on the kit I cut, um, that's, that's the crossover board I sent. And it's designed and cut to uh, fit right on the top and the bottom. That's what these holes are for, they align. So you've, you've got your attachment method all figured out there. Um, this is somewhat smaller. You could probably get the components to fit on there. The thickness, I just, you don't need it for a crossover board. And so I, it is what it is. Um, not bad, not good, just is. And, uh, and you know, th this actually used the, my construction. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to claim that I know it all or that I created something that was so extraordinary, but I did seek to make a, a butt jointed cabinet into something that was better from a woodworking perspective. And, um, and I, I, I think, I think I succeeded there. And I guess, uh, you know, the fact that someone chose to sort of follow my lead, it tells me that at least I wasn't all wrong. Um, so, you know, some things about th this is really similar to, to the brace I designed, which is quite different from what's in the plans. Uh, the one thing I'd call out here is, again, sharp corners. Uh, my understanding, that's not the best. So that's why you don't see it in my kits. Um, so let's kind of go about this the same way. Let's, uh, let's check the tweeter fit. Oh, you know what? Let's, let's do this. Let's weigh it. Uh, this is better MDF. This is what I'd consider to be kind of mid-tier uh, MDF. And this should be really close to the same size. Um, well, actually, oh, I know why it's not. Uh, the rabbits in this aren't cut as deep, and, and so the, the size of the, the front is going to be a little bit different. But um, they're close. And... Um, so that one is the one I cut. This is the one that came from this kit. That weighs 20 ounces. And this smaller piece, actually we're back to the same thing. So 22.35 versus 20.06. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The amount at uh, 06, I don't know if that's important, but suffice to say, uh, there's only one other um, MDF I've found that compares with Ranger Board Platinum, in my opinion. And I did some kind of extensive, uh, oh, I won't call it research, but it was me being curious about the properties of it. And uh, that product is called Medex, um, and I find it to be just as hard to get. And I, I, the reason I landed on this is because it's a little easier for me to get. And I, I just like the way it machines better. It, it, they're so similar to almost be, you can't really differentiate between the two. But those two stand head and shoulders above everything else that I've messed around with. And I, I've tried quite a few things. I've tried different sources, so on and so forth, anyway. Let's try the tweeter fit. So that's better. That's definitely better. When I push down on that, it's got, uh, it's got clearance so that when the, uh, when, after you finish these, I mean, assuming you paint them or something like that, that you're going to end up with a tweeter that's flush, pretty flush. And I'm curious. The other flat pack that I showed earlier, uh, 
I will tell you that the difference between the two um, baffles was enough that the, the tweeter would fit down a little ways in one, but it wouldn't fit at all in the other. So that's, that would tell me something about either the hold down method on the router or the accuracy of the machine. I don't know exactly what to derive from it. And to be honest, it's, it's really not a whole lot of concern to me because it's not my product. Um, this is better. And that, that appears to be allowing a little bit of clearance. And uh, so that's a good thing. And, and to demonstrate why that's a good thing, we'll put that together. So that, you can see that that woofer is resting right on the top of this and, uh, and still sitting flush on the cabinet. So good thing there. Okay, so uh, let's move on to assembly here a little bit. So th this is really similar. Uh, I, I don't know, well, you know what, I'm not even going to go there. Never mind. This differs from my kit in one, um, well, maybe more than one way, but uh, this dowel is set exactly in the center of this panel. If you were to look at this one, at least the plans I used, uh, the dowel is not in the center. It's actually a half inch higher, as I recall. I might be wrong about that dimension, but it, it's not, it's in the middle from front to back, but not in the middle from top to bottom. And actually in my kit, it aligns exactly with, with this brace, which goes right there. And um, in this kit, you're gonna have to locate these braces on your own. You need to get them pretty close to the middle there. Uh, and pretty close to the middle there. And again, I add an additional brace because I can, uh, because of the way I located that. Uh, the, the baffle is the least stiff part of the whole cabinet because it's got big holes cut in it. And uh, so seeking to reinforce that a little bit, I put a brace that runs from here to the side. And I'll put my kit up here and do the same thing with it. So. Um, the, I guess the one downside to the way I do it is it's got to be oriented right, but all the kits I send out now, uh, I learned from having people email me and say, what, what did I do wrong? Or they recognize what they did wrong. Um, I, I'm stamping top and I orient the front uh, on the parts that it makes a difference on. So. If you're looking at something like I'm assembling it here, it doesn't say top on all the pieces that it's relevant to, you're doing something wrong. Um, so, and this, this method of assembly is something that, this is how I do it in the shop, and I've, I've assembled quite a few of these. So, um, I guess I've, I've gotten it down to where the methodology is, is pretty straightforward. So I couldn't even get this far on the first kit. I mean, it was, it was so out of whack. You know what blows my mind about that is I, I look at it and I say, how, how could anybody even think this was workable? I mean, it's like they just threw a bunch of uh, MDF pieces in a box and said, there we go. <laughs> and, you know, some parts of it were semi-close, but mostly not so. Um, so it looks like the you know page has been taken out of my book here. A um, little bit of clearance on the interior brace, and uh, so you know so far so good. Now one of the nice things about rabbits, obviously, I can clamp that up, and it it sort of self locates. I mean this. Uh, this is intended to, you know, these clamps are holding it against the vertical side, so I should say one side of the rabbit, and then this clamps the whole cabinet together. 
and mm -hmm. then the top and the bottom can be applied, and they sort of self-locate. And that, on this one, uh, dropped right into place. Um, I shoot for a little bit tighter clearance there because I want that joint to be uh, snug, more than snug. It's, it's kind of tight, and, and that's intentional. And, you know, uh, one of the kits, one of the kits, one of the things about the kit I designed, as I designed it, um, I wanted to have a little bit of overhang on all the sides because it, it's always been a problem. I mean, it, let's say this is a little shy, and, and actually this is a little shy. Uh, I mean, I'm feeling this edge here, and, and I cannot get that to go away, folks. Um, I'm, I'm kind of pushing this around. And bear in mind, this, this cabinet is clamped just like it would be if I had glue on it. Um, so I've got a little bit of an edge there. And uh, the common thinking in the past has been, oh, we'll just sand down the side. Well, theoretically, you would, in order to keep that side flat, you would have to plane down whatever distance that is on the whole side. You know, could you roll it off? Maybe you could. It'd take a lot of sanding. So overhangs seem to me to be the good way to go about this. You overhang it, and then you can easily take a router and flush trim it and get a really nice, crisp edge. And there are no concerns. Uh, when, uh, you know, of humidity, uh, depending on where it's cut versus where it's being assembled, that's a that's a real thing. It doesn't affect MDF as much as it does hardwood or even plywood, but it's a, it's a real thing. So, um, so far, this to me is is a problem. I I can't push that out. So it tells me that that some thing is not square here, and uh, I'd be curious to know what it is. Now, so there's two tops and bottoms that worked the same. So because I've got three things doing the same thing, uh, this might tell me that uh, this cabinet's out of square just a little bit. So let's do a little measuring. Well, Actually, diagonal measurements like this are actually a pretty accurate way to tell whether something is square. And that is really square. So um, I, I'm not sure what the, what the problem is. Uh, the solution in my mind would be to overhang this more when it's being cut out. Um, you know, holding tight clearances I got to tell you this. Now, this is something I have messed around with a lot of flat packs. And the, the common thinking for years and years was, yeah, we'll just make it flush. That doesn't work. And, and it, it's not because it's not doable. It's, it's because it's not reproducible when you take all the variables into account. So you've got a variance in thickness of material, in humidity where it's being assembled, in so many factors, and not to mention the, the, the accuracy of the machine it's being cut on. So those things are not solvable problems in the real world. If you were doing all these in one shop, in a production environment, it'd be a little bit different story. But when we're talking about doing stuff by different individuals all over the place, I mean, you know, not only all over the United States, but I've shipped flat packs to Ireland and Australia. And, oh gosh, I can't remember all the places. It's not inexpensive, but you know, people have sought to, to do that. So, um, all that to say that there's a reason why the flat pack that I, that I provide, it, it was designed the way it is. Uh, I, I think I read a comment, this was on somebody else's channel, they were assembling my cabinet and somebody commented, oh wow, you know, it's too bad they couldn't make it accurate enough. Well, there's nothing 
inaccurate about the machine I use or the programming that I, that I did. Um, it, it, all of it is intentional. So if it sounds like I'm crowing about my own stuff, I am. Um, I'm proud of it. I, uh, I have yet to see its equal. Um, and, and this is close. I, I got to say, this is, this is not too far off the mark. Um, this problem of the overhangs um, is an oversight. It, 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 sh it didn't have to be that way. By just cutting this out larger, it would have solved that problem. Um, and, and, you know, perhaps they did solve the problem. For whatever it's worth, uh, when I cut batches of these, and I cut them in batches of about 20, th that's the only way I can do this and, and not lose my shirt in the deal. So um, I take an example, a random example from any batch I cut and I assemble it just like I'm doing here. And so I, I constantly monitor the, uh, the, the accuracy of what I'm doing because, uh, well, if, because I don't want to ship stuff that's not as close to 100% as I can make it. Yeah, you know, once again, that might say something about me, but um, so if, if the other cabinet got an F, this one gets, uh, I don't know, B, um, it, it, it's not missing by much, but, uh, I, I will selfishly say that, uh, I, I think the kit I provide is more accurate and, you know, does that affect the sound? Ah, I don't know. That gets into a whole bunch of audio file stuff that I just don't get much enjoyment out of talking about. So, all right, there's kit number two. Um, like I said, it, it not bad, could be better. Um, and uh, let's get kit number three up here. All right, so here we have kit number three. Now, um, I know this cabinet maker who cuts this kit really well, and he's fussy. He's really fussy. <laughs> and that's me, folks, in case you're wondering. Um, I, uh, there is not one aspect of this flat pack that I haven't examined. I, I really did intend to do something that was a cut above what was available in the marketplace. And, uh, you know, I was talking to, to someone recently about flat packs and, and uh, oh, <laughs> no surprise there, right? I mean, it's kind of a lot of my life, it seems. But, uh, and I think I said something like, I've never stopped developing this. And, and I really haven't. I mean, obviously the gross development is done and, and uh, you know, I got a good number of them out there, like I said, all over the world. Um, and, you know, by and large, I think uh, success with, uh, with building has been good for people who have purchased it. Um, I have changed some things along the way, though. When I, when I figured out that sometimes it wasn't obvious the way things should be oriented, like a front going this way instead of this way into the cabinet, um, I... I made changes. I, I had stamps made. I put some markets on in inconspicuous places so that future builders wouldn't encounter the same thing. So, and the fact that I continually test them, I, not only do I build them myself, I, I, like I was saying earlier, I test a random example out of every batch I cut to make sure that I'm holding tolerances where I want them and all that. So suffice to say that that fussiness uh, on my part is probably a good thing for uh, the end users. So talk about what we got here. Uh, that's the, the uh, uh, crossover board I send with cabinets. And that is designed, ah, there's the missing dowel. I wondered where that went. Um, these come with screws, which is another thing. I, <laughs> when I first started doing these, I assumed that there were enough screws coming with the flat pack, or I should say with the, with the speaker kit that would do these. But 
those screws seemed to be missing or they were, uh, they were too small. So I started including them in my flat pack, but they are the screws that attach the crossover board to the bottom. And um, it's just one more thing that I could do on the router to make the life of the builder a little bit easier. There's no wondering about how they're going to attach it. And by the way, the, the tops and the bottoms are exactly the same in, in this kit. And um, so you can't get it wrong. You, you don't have to pay attention to which one goes on the bottom because they're identical. And I don't think anybody would ever put the crossover on the top, uh, although you could. So yeah, whatever that's worth. So all that's done for you. Um, crossover boards, you'll see these in two different forms. Uh, these are birch veneer. And I cut these in bulk. I, I, I cut these a uh, four by eight sheet of just crossover boards. And it's all fits into that mini mass production idea. If, if I had to do these one at a time, there's no way that I could, I could sell them for the, the price that I do. I mean, just the handling of the material, the waste factor would be lots more. So when I say mini mass production, I'm, I really mean it. I'm, I'm doing these in bulk, but small quantities, but not one at a time. It, it just, it's not feasible. Not feasible for reasonable money, let's put it that way. And, and I guess that's my judgment. Crossover boards, if it, oh, I, what I was gonna say there is, uh, these are birch because there was a time, uh, material av availability has become a uh, concern. And at one point I couldn't get quarter inch MDF plane. And so I bought a sheet of this uh, with birch on it. Um, obviously a little more expensive, but I really didn't have a choice if I wanted to do things the way I've done them. So braces, you'll see more of these with my kit because I'm going to add a brace that goes here. Let me see if I can show you where that goes. Probably doing all this sort of redundantly, but that, that brace lands. So this is a, a baffle and this is, and then it lands right there and it braces the baffle. Um, there's no downside to it, you know, whether there's a measurable upside, uh, you could get into the theoretical aspects of it. But it's the one thing that just kind of drives me a little bit nuts about um, this, this small little world is sometimes stuff, you run down rabbit holes that just don't make any difference in terms of the end result. And, and I, I tried to address all of those that made sense to me. Some of them, admittedly, I, I probably left on the table. Okay, so, um, you know, the difference you'll see here is these are all cut so they locate the, the braces I send with the kit. I just think it, it's a little more elegant to design that way. It takes a little more time on the router, but um, it's, uh, just the convenience that I, I think is worthwhile. And I, 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 admittedly, I can't look at this through the eyes of uh, the people who purchase these from me because, you know, I'm, I'm the one that's doing it all from A to Z. But uh, let's, uh, let's put it together. There's one other thing that I guess I want to... So uh, one thing I should probably mention, so there's, you'll see these aren't identical. They are mirror images. So with my kit, there's a right and a left. And the reason, I didn't start out that way, but um, it, it became obvious that uh, if I wanted to include this brace and I wanted to do things in the way that I imagined them, that uh, orientation right and left would be something I have to do. So. All my cabinet sides aren't the same. You got rights and you got lefts. But it wasn't done without a reason. So let's just kind of begin here. And this is exactly how I would do this. If uh, when I assemble them, I do it this way. And uh, if you're doing it some other way, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's, it, you, you're reinventing a wheel that I already invented and not to say that I'm airproof or in, infallible, but uh, um, 
there was thought that went into all of it. The only reason I say that is they've had a number of people, you know, send me photos of stuff they've done and I, it, it wasn't the way I intended, which is the reason I made the, the assembly video in the first place. And admittedly, that assembly video is kind of long in tooth now, and I know the audio is bad, and it talks about placing the braces. Well, that's different now, so perhaps I should remake that, but uh, I guess I, I see it as water under the bridge, and I'm not too jazzed about doing a repeat there, but maybe it maybe it'll become necessary or maybe I'll feel more like doing it at some point. There's one kind of key thing that I'm going to point out here and and understand these parts that I'm working with, these are parts I just pulled off a shelf. These these parts are all stocked. I have <laughs> you can't see it. <laughs> but back in the back of my shop, um, there are some shelves, and I, I cut these, uh, like I said, about 20 cabinets at a time, and uh, I just stockpile the parts, and when someone orders one, I go back and I pull the parts, and I know what all that consists of, so you get all this stuff, and um, so this isn't, a, this isn't any kind of a special cabinet here, this is, this is how the parts are, and one thing that I started doing early on, and I don't know how evident this is going to be. I'm going to see if the camera will focus. So what I'm trying to show there is I cut a bevel on this edge, and that is for one reason. I want this joint, the, what's now the vertical face, the inside face here, I want it to be a snug fit because that is part of the strength of the cabinet. Now, is it a deal breaker without it? No, probably not. Butt joints can be functional, but uh, it's just me being fussy. So the whole idea here was that it sort of funnels the, the top and the bottom into place. So you're not working, when you have a square edge up against a square edge, and these are square sharp edges, um, the, the likelihood that you bark it up or it doesn't fit very well is, is really good. So I put those tapers on there to, to kind of funnel it into place. So the way this works is you hit it like that, and you think, oh, well, wow, you made it too tight. And ah, that's, that's a choice I made. That, that is not about uh, making it easy to assemble. It's about making it good in the end result as best I can considering I have many different assembly people out there, meaning people who are building the cabinets. And uh, so it's intentional. Um, and the only reason I point that out is because, like I said, there's not much of this cabinet I haven't thought about. And I've had people email me. They notice that bevel and they said, why is that there and what should I be doing with it? It's, it's, once it's assembled, it's no concern. But um, that is exactly how I want it. And I, it, in my opinion, exactly how it should be. Um, and if you're not assembling the cabinets this way, you're missing some of the the design intent uh, for whatever that's worth. And, oh, you know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do the, the uh, driver testing here that I have. Um, and, and by the way, that bevel affects nothing in terms of the strength of the cabinet. Uh, this is so far beyond necessary strength. Um, you know, it, it borders on overkill. If, if any of you watched my, my channel for a while, you know that I took a pair of these cabinets built exactly this way and uh, parked a pickup on top of them. So what does that prove? Well, that proves they're strong. Um, and a highly integrated structure is, is a good structure. And, and that doesn't really matter if it's a cabinet you're putting in your house or speaker cabinet. 
Um, the closer you can come to, you know, the more precise you can make it, the, uh, the better um, I think it's going to be. So let's go back to fitment of drivers. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little distracted with my own thing. Oh, I forgot to show you something. Oh, well. Um, so driver fitment, that goes in there. Uh, I can tell you that I clearance that hole for, um, oh, you know something, and I should have pointed this out. Uh, this tweeter, which is kind of my test mule, um, I took the gasket off of it. And that gasket, and I still have it somewhere, but uh, uh, that gasket is going to affect how this fits down into the cabinet. And so if, if you look, and if you look, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you can see that, but this actually sits down below the level a little bit. And the reason it does is because that gasket's gonna jack that up a little bit, which I should probably point out if that gasket were on there, which by the way, it comes with the tweeter. It, it's glued on there. I, I specifically took it off for some measurement purposes, but uh, if, if, so that cabinet I just showed you a little bit earlier, that's actually gonna make this stand up. Maybe we should, maybe we should backpedal a little bit here and I'll, I'll show you that. Bear with me. Okay, gasket. You don't have to worry about this. This comes with the tweeter. Um, like I said, I, I took it off because I, I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but th this is my mule, like I said. So once I get the gasket in there and you put the screws in that, that's gonna come out real flush. Now, I wanna try this. Okay, so this is the exhibit B, cabinet number two. Let's try the same drill. Um, well, I'm going to have to backpedal a little here, folks. With that gasket in there and me putting pressure on it like the screws would, that tweeter sits proud of the surface. That is, a, it's an error. <laughs> uh, there's no other way I can describe that because it's going to hold that, uh, the, the woofer up off the surface. That is not good. Um, if one was making a choice, a little too deep would be better than a little too shallow because one only affects the tweeter, the other affects both the woofer and the tweeter in terms of fitment. So um, I have to take this one down a notch or two uh, because of that. I should have recognized that. It's one of the things that I recognize when I, when I redid these videos. Anyway, so uh, let's see, what else? Oh, you know what? Let's talk about this a little bit. So uh, it used to be that I offered uh, a back that had a rabbited hole for the binding posts. Now, these binding posts are, they're inexpensive. I mean, this, this whole assembly here is uh, probably less than two bucks. Um, and, and you know, you can get some of these like this or similar to this from uh, Parts Express or any of the places, Meniscus or Mattisound or any of those. Um, and it occurred to me, well, first of all, uh, that caused me to cut at one time three different backs. I had a combo back, I had a electro tube, electra tube connector back, and I had a binding post back. And very few people were ordering the, uh, the, the binding posts. And, and so I was mulling it over one day and thought, well, maybe I should just not produce those anymore. Cause it's just inventory that I have to hang on to. And sometimes it sits and it sits and it sits. And from a business perspective, anytime you have inventory that's not Rotating, it's, it's money you'll never see. So, um, and because I'm lean and mean, you know, you know, stuff like that is important to me. So 
I started looking at this from a different perspective. I thought, okay, so I understand why some people would want binding posts. Maybe they don't like the idea of, uh, of tube connectors, which I'm a tube connector fan. I like them, and I use them all the time in almost all the stuff I build that's GR research. And uh, so I started looking at this thinking, okay, so you take this, I, I cannot see in speakers like this, I mean, the theory is, okay, you've got a flush fit. So you could theoretically, you know, push that up against a wall or something. Well, nobody does that. The, the, a rear ported speaker is going to sound not too good if it's just mashed up against the wall. So uh, what's the purpose of, of binding post cups? Not binding posts, but the cups. And, you know, when you compare it to the resonant qualities of MDF versus the plastic, I thought, eh, I don't know. So this is my solution. Um, the way this is designed to work is this binding post is a kind of a snug interference fit with that bushing and so a back that's cut for electric tube connectors and this could be mine or it could be anybody's um, you put that bushing into the electro tube connector hole and that washer goes on the back and then there's more hardware that you would attach the uh, internal wire to but so that's the way that works and it, it makes binding posts possible and the whole idea of it being flush on the back, <laughs> I gotta tell you, I just, I don't see the point. It seems like a legacy thing in the audio world that has no particular purpose, at least in a, an installation like this. I mean, I can think way, way back to some of the first AR speakers and stuff like that. They didn't have binding post cups. I just had something like this. I have, I don't know. If, if, if you got a, a good reason for a binding post cup, uh, leave it in the comments, because I'd be curious to know. It just seems to be kind of an irrelevant uh, thing in, in the world of speaker building these days. But I could be wrong. I, you know, wouldn't be the first time. So. There's that. Um, you can get those from me. Yeah, it'd be nice if I had a website you'd go through and see, maybe someday. Um, but uh, I, I do want to let you know that uh, I, I feel almost guilty that, that it's been so long since I've, I've produced a video because I, my intention was not to have these big gaps. But other parts of my life um changed and and this was uh, the speaker building was kind of the the victim of that I, you know i should say the, the videos were sort of the victim of that um but i never quit building speakers <laughs> so the stuff behind me is stuff that's kind of in process the uh, xls encores you see here are uh, something i dreamed up actually some test cabinets that i had put together some Baltic birch cabinets and it's just been sitting on my shelf and I've been kind of wondering what to do with them. So I decided on uh, this, uh, and for those of you, that's a really recognizable pattern that I tried to sort of emulate what uh, Eddie Van Halen did on his sort of iconic Frankenstrat, I think he called it. And so it's my tribute. Um, you know, I don't listen to Van Halen a lot anymore, but uh, it was, it was the kind of music I grew up on and, and uh, always kind of admired um, his prowess on the guitar. So that's my Van Halen tribute, uh, specifically Eddie, I guess. And then this, um, these are uh, GR Research NX Studios. And uh, I have had those kits for a long time. I've built a number of them for other people and uh, not, not really finished cabinets, but just assemble them. And, and uh, this was a set I decided to modify and uh, kind of do my own thing, which if you watch my videos, you know I'm kind of all about doing my own thing. So um, 
this, <laughs> I took Jay's cabinets and I added to the bottom and I put these grooves in and I changed the way the front looks with these bevels. I, I did a lot of modifications. It would be hard to duplicate now because uh, he has taken the tweeter and moved it up in the cabin a little bit um, so that this space no longer exists in the same way. But uh, the, the big thing here was the, so this design is one I've had for a while and I, I can, in the software I use, I can, I can manipulate it and change it and reorient it. But I always thought it was kind of a pretty design. So um, what I've done here is, is use an old technique called flocking. And flocking is about uh, putting some sticky glue on that's the same color as that. And then you put this I think it's rayon or it might be nylon fibers or maybe they're both available. Um, anyway, and then you, you blow it in there and it and once it dries, it sort of glues that in place and it becomes this kind of soft and you, you can't really see that, I imagine, from the camera's perspective. But it's, it's, uh, it, it's the kind of stuff you'd see inside of a jewelry box or something like that. And that area and, and I think uh, maybe the custom car world is where that reside now and I thought well why not why not bring it into this world and I've had the stuff to do it for some years and and so I dug all that out and and I intend to do a video on on that process it's not particularly hard um, it's not really expensive so if someone wanted to do that themselves it occurred to me that you know maybe that's a process I could show so I want to I, I want to do a video like that hopefully that's in the in the mix in the next six months or so. Um, ah, I think that covers about everything. Did I eat up an hour yet? I mean, it seems like I've been talking a lot, which I always do. So, uh, you know, maybe some of this is helpful to you. I, I guess I am crowing on my own stuff a little bit, but uh, it's, it's not without some reason behind it. I'm not doing it to be mean, which uh, I don't know, I, I just, hesitated for a long time because I was, I was reluctant to make it seem like I was pointing a finger at somebody saying, you're doing a bad job. And uh, so I, I hope that I haven't gone down that road. It, it's really not my intention. But, um, you know, I've invested a lot of myself into this whole XLS project and Flatpak project. And, and uh, I guess on one hand, I'm flattered that people sort of decided to look at the design I brought forth and, and sort of copy it. On the other hand, I have to say from a competitive standpoint, I look at it and say, if, if we're going to be in the same sandbox, bring your A game. That's the best I can say about it. So it, it does raise the competitive part of me a little bit. And uh, I, I try and squelch that as much as I can because it doesn't serve me very well in many cases. But I'm going on and on. So let's just end it there, folks. You'll see a video from me not too long from now. I don't know. I think it'll probably be the, the flocking video because I'd like to get those speakers done so I can put them in the house and listen to them. So uh, be nice to your neighbor. And I'll see you next go-round.